Hello friends, thank you for watching this video. I am Mohammed, and today we're gonna be discussing something really interesting regarding performance of our web API. We're gonna see how we can actually implement Redis and caching in order for us to boost the performance of our API. We're gonna go through the theory of caching and basically why do we need it, the different types of cache that exist, and then we're gonna be seeing how we can actually implement all of that inside our .NET 6 web API. So if you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. It will really help the channel. As well, if you'd like to support me, uh, please try, uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon or buying me a coffee. If you support me on Patreon, you'll be able to get access to all of the source code. So now, without further ado, grab your cup of coffee and let's get started. In order for us to know if our API is actually performant and is actually delivered the level of performance that our application requires, there's multiple ways that we can actually implement in order for us to achieve this performance. And one of these ways is actually caching. And by caching here, we mean by actually caching the response. We're gonna go through this video first by actually going through the theory of caching, see how actually we can implement it, see the role it can play and how it actually can elevate some of the uh, processing power that our API needs to do and basically have a much more faster response time with effort to, uh, whenever a user is trying to do any calls. So without further ado, let's check right now uh, what caching is and how we can actually start implementing in our .NET application and web APIs. So. As we can see here, this is the normal process when it comes to an API request. So we have a client which actually doing a call to our application. Let's say uh, it's gonna get a list of something. The application is gonna receive this response. Once the application actually received this response, it's gonna send the request to the database. The database can do the query on the data prepare the data, send it back to the application, the application will verify it, and once that is done, it's gonna ship it off to the user. So we can see here that we have basically one, two, three, four steps, and basically we have multiple intermediary in order for us to get this data. So the client will go through the server, the server will get it from the database, and then the flow back is gonna be similar. So from the database to the application to the client. And that's fine if, for example, you're working with a like a medium application, we don't really have, uh, you don't really have time sensitive information that you need to get, so you don't really need a millisecond approach that you need to achieve and all of that. So, but in case you have that high performance requirement, this uh, model is not really feasible and this model is not really uh, gonna give you that millisecond response time that you're gonna be needing because uh, although the client is actually doing calls to the server, the server is doing calls to the database and that's gonna be another bottleneck because from one connection to another, from one connection to another, and there we can see where the bottleneck lies. But what we can do actually right now is let's see another implementation with, an, uh, with actually caching in place. So within this implementation, we're gonna be taking the same approach as before. A client decide to get a list of some things from the server. The server is gonna receive this request it's gonna process this information. Once this information is being processed as it should be, it's gonna go to the database. Database is gonna do the query on the database on the data. Once the data is available, it's gonna send it back to the application. The extra level here is we're copying the data, whatever of the database has returned, we're putting it inside a cache. And basically a cache here is like a temporary storage. And that means that this data that we just received from the database, it's gonna live inside this cache, it's the temporary storage that we're gonna have. It's gonna have an expiry time. And basically once that data is there, we can actually reutilize this data instead of actually going back to the database. And that basically elevates the requirement for us to go to the database, do the query, execute the query. It could be a very complicated query for all we know and getting back the result. That way the results is already available for us directly from the cache. And once the application actually save the data into the cache, what it does is basically send it back to the cloud and once it's back to the client, uh, the data is there. So how will this help us? So let's say after, for example, 10 seconds, the user requests this data again. So what's gonna happen in that scenario? In that scenario, in case the data actually uh, uh, in the database is uh, in the cache story is valid. The client will do the request to the server. The server is going to receive this request. It's going to check in the, uh, in the cache. It's going to say, okay, I have this data in the cache. It's actually valid within the actual time frame that I need. Because it's valid within the time frame that I need, I can reutilize this. And basically here we can see that the response came back to the service from the cache, actually from not from the database. And once it came back to the application from here, what, it, what did it do? It actually go back to the client and send 
back the response. And we can see through this example here that we have actually removed the uh, database integration completely for that request because that data that we need from the database is already being cached inside our, uh, or basically it's already being stored inside our cache and we can actually utilize it from there rather than actually going through the full process of going to the database, executing the query, and then getting back the information and sending it back to the user. Because even the data that we're storing in the cache, it's already fully processed. So we have already verified it in the right format. We have already created the right uh, response type that we want to send back to the user. So it's already ready for us. We don't really need to do any further um, modification on the data. All we need is just grab and send back. So for this reason here, we can see that the database is actually providing us with, uh, sorry, the cache is already providing us with a lot of good functionalities. And here, what we're going to be implementing within today's video is we're going to be seeing in how we can actually create a web API in .NET 6. We're going to basically create a database, a random database, and have a table there. And then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be utilizing Redis as our database, prov our cache provider. And within Redis, we're going to be storing and caching the data there. And once we actually store the data in Redis, we're going to be seeing how we can actually reutilize the data inside of Redis instead of actually going every time to the database and get the information. So this video will basically will be able to help you to see how we can actually implement uh, caching inside your .NET 6 web API applications. You can see how you can set expiry time to the data, how you can actually store and retrieve information from your uh, cache. As well, you'll be able to see how you can actually utilize this within the Docker containers. Great. So now that we have covered all of that, the next step for us is basically we're going to be creating our web application. So let's go to our terminal. Let's make this a bit bigger. Perfect. So once we are in our terminal, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be navigating to my desktop work, let's say learning, I'm going to put dot .NET, I'm going to say um, caching, and then I'm going to create a new web application. And here, as we all know, to create a web application, we're just going to be utilizing the dot .NET in new keyword. So we're going to put dot .NET, new web API, and I'm going to call this a, let's say, call it caching uh, web API, something like that. And now it's going to create the API for me. Perfect. Now that has created the web API for me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the caching folder and I'm just going to open Visual Studio Code. Okay, perfect. Now let me just fix those sizes directly. Uh, let's make it 32, 32. And let's zoom in a bit. Uh, okay, let's see if this is, looks good. Yes, I think maybe a bit smaller, that should be fine. Okay, that should be fine. Or we can make this a bit bigger and just make this zoom level. Uh, sorry, we'll make this uh, 30 instead. That should be fine as well. Okay, so once we have done all of that, let's say not now. The first thing that I want to do here is basically just open a terminal. And inside my terminal here, all I'm gonna be doing is just put .NET build. I just wanna make sure that my application is building as it should be. And as you can see here, I have build succeeded, which is basically exactly the information that I want. So once we have done that, the next step is because basically uh, we're gonna be utilizing Redis and Redis is gonna be our main uh, cache provider. But before we jump into that, there is one point that I would like to clarify is caching is already, there's two types of caching that actually exists. And let's take a look at this before we actually jump into more of this. So caching is, there's two level. So there's gonna be the in memory cache. Oops, I don't know what happened, let's zoom out. Okay, that's weird. I'm not sure why it zoomed out like that, but that's for later. Uh, let's go down. Da, da, da. Yes, we have the in-memory cache. And we have the other one, which is going to be the distributed cache. Because it's really important for us to understand the difference between them. Because if you, if you come across, you'll understand the difference. 
So what's the difference between these two? Okay, let's make it like this. So the main difference between the in-memory cache and the distributed cache is basically the in-memory cache lives within the application itself. So let's say we have a server and this server is compromised of let's say five gigabits of RAM. It has two CPUs and one terabyte of SSD for example. And this is the server that we're running on. So let's say if we have an in-memory cache, what's, what would that will do? Basically a chunk of the RAM that we currently have it's going to be utilized for caching the information. So let's say right now our uh, our server has five gigabits of RAM. So instead of having five, for example, we're going to have one RAM dedicated for the cache and the rest is going to be utilizing for the application. So the first thing that we're doing here is we're actually reducing the capability of our application because we are reducing the available memory for it. So from five, it went to four. But on the other hand, what we have here is we also have the uh, cache available for us for one GB. And that cache will basically, it's going to be much more faster for us to access information from within our RAM than actually trying to access it from a different service. So right now, as we said, inside our uh, RAM, it's going to be separated to memory for our application and basically memory for the cache. And that way, because it's inside stored, because it's stored inside the memory, it's called a uh, in-memory cache. And that's really important because as we said, it's fast, but it's taking resources from our application. On the other hand, there is distributed cache like Redis, which we're going to be utilizing in this session. And basically Redis is like a completely separate application which, which runs alongside of our web application or web API. And it's responsible for storing the cache there. So what's the benefit of having Redis done in, uh, other than in memory? Basically Redis is a much more distributed one. So what does that mean? So let's, first of all, it will not take any resources from our application. And that's really important to understand because if our application is really high performant, we need every single a bit of resources that's available for us to actually achieve that level of performance that's needed. So that's the first point. The second point is because our uh, Redis lives outside the actual uh, application, it means that once our application scales up, we will be actually able to utilize that cache with all of the different instances that we have scaling up. So for example, let's say my application is running on one server right now and it's actually running as it should be. But what happened? If, for example, after like, let's say there's a peak, uh, a peak uh, users in our, my application and basically my application users goes from 100 users to let's say 50,000 users. So what's going to happen there? The application and the servers is going to scale up. So from one server, I could have, for example, 20 or 25 servers available for me. And basically, if I have a distributed cache, all of these servers will be able to actually communicate with that cache directly and with, uh, with the Redis cache directly and put the information from there. Instead of every single one of them have to, resp to manage their in-memory cache, the Redis server will be able to actually provide this information for me. So this is really important for us to understand. So let's do a quick overview of what does this look like. So let's say here, this is my application. And I have, for example, the RAM. So this is the RAM inside my application. And basically, this RAM is going to be separated into two. Let's make it like this, for example. Send to back. And this one will be something like that. So this is in memory. So basically we're gonna have one GB, for example, as we said, for uh, caching. And the rest, for example, this is all hypothetical. So the rest for uh, is gonna be for the application. And here we can see that, for example, and this is out of the five GB that exists for the RAM, for example. And here we can see that how it's different. And let's say the application will scale up. So this will be duplicated on all different servers. So we can see here that it's going to be duplicated, duplicated, so on and so forth. And here basically we're able to see that the level of complexity of managing the RAM and basically the performance hit that we might get. On the other hand, let's say this is our application. Let's take it again. So this is our nice application here, our web API. We're gonna just call it app. And basically instead of this app relying on storing or basically managing its own memory, what we can do is we just, you can utilize Redis. 
and basically Redis will live alongside the application and we're going to be able to connect to it. So let's say this scales up. All we need to do is just connect these instances from here into Redis. And basically all of them now are sharing the actual memory that exists. And the, here we can see the main difference. First of all, no, no, no performance hit is being uh, occurring in our application. Second of all, if uh, scalability, it's already available for us out of the box because we're utilizing the same Redis instance. And on top of all of that, all of the uh, performance of Redis, it's uh, the, basically whenever the requirement gets higher, or for example, we need more access to cache, Redis will actually manage this for us instead of us having to manually do it. So I just wanted to point it out here, the difference between in-memory and uh, distributed one, because basically we're gonna be utilizing the distributed one inside the uh, example that we're gonna be seeing today. So once that we have covered this point, the next point is, how are we gonna be running Redis uh, inside our machine right now? Because Redis, it's a very powerful tool and it's available for us. What you need to do is you need to have Docker available. So if we go to Docker, what you need to do is you need to download Docker for your own machine. So concise, uh, since I'm on Mac, I need to download the Mac version. If you're a Windows or Linux, you can actually download it. It's for free for personal use. So it's really good. You don't really have to pay uh, any money for it. It's completely free. So once you download it and install, you should be able to see like a small whale icon here on top. And basically once you open it, you will, you will be able to see something like this. So like a dashboard with a green icon here, green whale, and this green whale illustrate that the application is running successfully. So uh, once that is done, the next step for, you, for us is what we need to do is we need to go to our terminal again. And basically what we need to do is we need to run some commands inside our terminal to run Redis. So, because uh, I have a different video that goes through containers, how we can run them and all of that, I'm gonna be linking it here somewhere if you wanna learn more about that. Uh, but if you're interested in this, please put a comment down below and I'll explore this in much more detail in a future video. But for now, we're just gonna see the command that we need in order for us to make Redis available for us out of the box. So, how, what are we gonna be doing? Basically, what we need to do is we need to run this command. Docker, which is basically we're referring to the Docker instance that we want to utilize. And then I'm saying that it needs to run something. I'm giving it a name. And this name is going to be, for example, MyRedis. We can call it whatever we want here. Make sure there's no spaces within the name. And then I'm going to specify the port that it needs to run on. And basically the default Redis port is 6379. So I'm going to be utilizing the same one. And basically once that is done, I'm just basically telling it that it needs to run in detach mode. It means that uh, it will run without actually me seeing the console log of, the, of Redis. I just want it to run and run in the background. I don't want to see it. And once that is done, I will. I want to. I want to tell it which image I want to use, and I want to use the Redis image. If you're wondering how did I know that, basically whenever you go to Docker, there's a search icon here. I just want to put Redis. And where is it? They change this website all the time. Uh, let's see. Redis Docker image. Okay, so we need to have the docker.com to find that, my mistake. And basically we can see that this is the Redis instance that we have. And basically we can see here, so these are some of the commands. So basically what I did is I came here to Docker Hub. I checked the official images that exist. I search for Redis, and once I search for Redis, I will be able to click on it, see the different ways that I want to implement it. We can see here we have different examples of how you want to run it, so on and so forth. And basically what I did is I ran this command. So once you run this command, I have already run it, so I don't want to run it again. But once you click on enter, basically the application will run. And the way and Redis basically will run. And how do we do, uh, do you verify that this is running? All you need to do is basically type docker ps, and once you type docker ps, you can see here that I have basically Redis running. It has been running for two days now on my machine. And we can see it's being connected to the port 6379 over TCP. Let me zoom in a bit so it will look cleaner. Yeah, so you can see here that my Redis is already uh, running and basically it has the name my Redis that I have already provide, provided for it. And that's all I need to do in order for me to have Redis. So as we can see here from a single line in co uh, 
inside my terminal with the utilization of uh, Docker, I was able to have a full instance of Redis available on my machine and running directly. I didn't really need to do a lot of config. I can do it, but I didn't really need to do a lot of configuration, installation, uh, version management. Docker took, uh, they took care of all of that. And basically all I needed to do is just, just run a single line of command and it's running for me. Perfect. So once I have done all of that, the next step is I wanna go to my code here and I'm gonna start building my application. So first things first is uh, because we're building actually a web API and I wanna connect to the database so we can mimic the live traffic, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be utilizing PostgreSQL in order for me to be actually, uh, uh, to actually connect to a database. So that's gonna be my first task is basically connect to Postgres, install all the different packages, creating an application DB context, a very simple one, one single table. And then we're gonna see how we can actually implement Redis as a serve, uh, caching as a service within our .NET 6 API. So once I have done all of that, the next step is for me, I just wanna put .NET. I'm gonna start installing my packages. So it's gonna be .NET add package. Let's see if it's looking good on the screen. Yes, it is. It might, it might turn it down, but that should be fine. And then I'm gonna put Microsoft dot entity oops okay let's clear this out so it will appear better on the screen or we can zoom out a bit okay i think that should be fine and let's clear this okay so it's gonna be dot not add package microsoft dot entity framework Core. Perfect. So now that my uh, NuGet package has installed successfully, so let's do it again. Let's see if we can see it. Let's put it up, up. Okay, we can see .NET at package Microsoft Entity Framework Core. So that's going to be the first one. The second one is going to be .NET add package npg sql .entity Framework. Okay, let's clear this up so it will be easier for you to see. So clear, let's do it again. So it's gonna be .NET add package uh, npg sql dot entity framework core dot postgres sql. And let's run this. We can see it has installed successfully. Let's clear this again. And the third one is gonna be .NET add package. It's gonna be entity, Microsoft, excuse me, dot entity framework core dot design. Great. Now, once we have done that, now we need to install the tools. So .NET add package microsoft.entity framework core.tools great then right now i need to install redis so basically it's going to be dot not okay let's clear this so it's going to be dot not add package stack exchange exchange dot redis and now that it has been installed successfully let's install the last one which is going to be dot not dot add package microsoft dot extensions dot caching dot stack exchange redis Perfect. So now that we have installed all of our packages, the next step is when we need to do is we need to go to our CS approach and make sure all of the packages are there. So right now, if we go to caching web API, and we can see here that I have all of my see all of my packages installed: Entity Framework Core, Design Tool, Stack and Change on Redis, Postgres, Redis, and basically Swashbuckle for the uh, uh, for our interaction with our web API. 
So once we have done all of that, the next step is we're gonna start creating our model and basically uh, we're gonna be utilizing, as we said, uh, Postgres. So I have a different video to see how we can actually install and set up Postgres on our machine. I'm not gonna go through this right now. I'll link that video here somewhere where you'll be actually able to go through that process. But just for the sake of this uh, information, uh, we're gonna assume that Postgres is already installed and configured and we're gonna be utilizing that configuration in order for us to actually connect to our uh, local database instance. So, first things first, inside the root folder here, I'm gonna be creating a new folder. I'm gonna call it models. And inside this models, I'm gonna be creating a new class. And this class, I'm gonna call it the driver. Basically, we're gonna building a F1 application. I think if you watch my videos, you can tell that I'm a big F1 fan. And basically, everything revolves around F1 when it comes to testing applications. So driver. And let's make this .NET 6 look and feel. And we're gonna have a very simple driver uh, uh, table. So it's gonna prop int ID. And then we're gonna have prop uh, string name. And we're just gonna put a driver number and that's it. Prop int, oops. Prop int driver number. Very simple. And once we have done all of that, and basically now we have our models ready, the next step for us is we need to start actually building our uh, AppDB context. So again, we're gonna create a new folder. And this folder, we're just gonna call it data. And basically within this data here, I'm gonna be creating a new class. And this class, I'm gonna call it AppDB context. And let's make it .NET 6 compatible, or basically just look and feel. All I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna basically uh, inherit from the DB context class. It's gonna tell me, I don't know it. So let's add uh, using. And then basically I'm gonna build my constructor. And it's gonna be very simple, DB context options, uh, DB context. And I'm gonna pass the options. And then all we need to do is pass it back to the base so it will know how to utilize it. And lastly, I'm gonna add my driver table. So that should be very simple. All I need to do is public DB set. Basically, I'm telling it that it needs to create a table and it's gonna be the driver table, oops. And it's gonna be called the drivers and that's it. And right now, if I click on this one here, perfect. So now I have my application DB context available for me. Great, so once that is done, next step is I'm gonna go to my connection string and I'm gonna basically connect it to my local instance of Postgres. So let's add here connection strings and I'm gonna call this sample DB connection. And I'm gonna just copy paste this connection string because I already have it instead of me trying to type it again. Again, this video is not really how to set up uh, Postgres. There's a way different video. If you wanna really learn about Postgres and how we can actually implement it, there's a way more in-depth video of how we can set up Postgres connected to your database. I'll link it here somewhere in the description down below so it will be available for you directly to you to learn more about it. But for now, we're just assuming that everything is already set up. So once that is done, so once that is done, the next step is I need to go to my program.cs and let's make this a bit smaller. And let's make sure this is looking good. Okay. Uh, inside my builder here, all I need to do is just basically add my uh, connection to my database. So it's going to be builder.services.add entity framework npg sql. That's correct. I'm going to say dot, let's put it on the new line, dot add uh, context, context, add db context. Uh, db context, yeah, and then I'm gonna pass the app db context. Let's see if it's gonna require us. Let, let's add this. And once that is done, all I need to do is now fill the options. And basically, it's gonna be let's put it here. Yeah, okay, it looks good. So it's gonna be options dot use. Uh, and where is it? use npg sql 
So this I can think is gonna require another using. Yes, exactly. And then once that is there, I need to just pass like an action string. So it's gonna be configuration, actually builder.configuration dot configuration dot get connection strings oops not children connection string and then all I need to do is just pass the connection string name that I have so all I'm gonna do is go to settings not settings this one to op settings copy this and put it here and now basically I should be have direct access to my application perfect once that is all done what I'm going to be doing right now, I'm just going to implement a migration to make sure that the table is there. And basically my application is running as it should be. The database is there. The app DB contact is running. That's all we need to do. So let's clear this again and let's make this a bit bigger. So uh, because we're running entity framework core, uh, we're just going to be utilizing .NET, EF, migrations, uh, I'm just going to call it initial migration. And right now this should basically create a migration script for us and we should be able to see that there's a new folder called migration created as we can see here and basically we can see that inside this we can see that we are able to create the folder with all of the columns uh, sorry create the table with all of the columns that we need so once we have created all of this the next step is of, first of all we basically create the migration the next step is we need to implement the migration on our database so now it's time to implement this migration so to do that, it's going to be .NET EF database update. Very simple. As we can see, the migration has been updated successfully. So right now, if we open DB Beaver, and if I just refresh here, you'll be able to see that I have a driver's table now. And it's going to be, if we click a view table, it's gonna be empty uh, and has ID, name, and driver number, and the data is empty. Exactly what we wanted. So once we have done all of that, the next step for us is uh, we need to start creating our uh, caching service. And this caching service that we're gonna be creating is we're gonna be uh, utilizing our uh, dependency injection. So we're gonna be creating as a service. We're gonna create an interface, and then we're gonna be creating an implementation for that interface. We're going to connect it to our problem.cs and then we can actually inject it in any controller that we want. So inside the root directory of our application, let's create a new folder. We'll call this folder services. And inside the services, I'm going to create a new interface and I'm going to call it iCache service. Let's make this.net6 look and feel. Perfect. So now we're going to have three basically uh, method inside our uh, interface. The first one is going to be T get data of type T and we're going to pass the string key. We're going to explain why did I make it uh, like that. And then we're going to put bool set data of type T again and it's going to take a string of uh, gonna be the key, then it's gonna take the T, which is gonna be the value that we wanna store. And then we're gonna take the date, time, offset, and we're just gonna call this expiration time, expiration time. And lastly, we're gonna put object, because basically we're gonna be removing data, so remove data, and it's just gonna take the key. So. This uh, interface here has three main methods. So the first one is going to be get data, uh, then it's going to be the uh, setting of the data, and then removing of the data. And the reason we made it uh, as a T, because basically uh, this is going to be like an anonymous type, because we don't really, uh, let's say we have a list of drivers, we have a list of teams, we have a list of equipments. We're going to have, in a normal database, you're going to have like, I don't know, tons uh, of tables, like maybe 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 tables there. You don't really want to create a service which basically very hard-coded to those tables. You want to make it as generic as possible. And basically, when we do it uh, like, uh, in this way, you'll be able to pass the type of, uh, of uh, files that you want to extract much more easier. So it could be a single, a single record. It could be a list of 100 records. It could be anything that we want. 
So that's why it's really important for us to basically make it as generic as possible so we can actually reutilize and that falls within the solid principle. So right, uh, create it once and use it rather than recreating multiple times. So once we have created the actual uh, uh, interface, the next step is gonna be the actual implementation for this. So we're gonna create a class. We're gonna call it cache service. And let's remove this. Perfect. And now that we have done that, let's do the implementation. Let's move this a bit back. The first thing that we need to do is we need to implement the interface. So I cache surface is going to say, oh, we haven't implemented. Okay, we'll implement it now. And then what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to have an I database and I'm going to call it cache DB. And let's fix this references. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to create a constructor. And I'm just going to call this create a variable called Redis so I can connect to the actual instance of Redis. And I'm going to put connection multiplexer. Connection, connection multi. Plexer, I think that's how you spell it. Let's see. Yes. Okay. Connection multiplexer dot connect. And basically what I need to provide here is the actual uh, path or basically the actual endpoint of my Redis. So if you remember, if we go back to, uh, to our terminal and let me zoom in again. You'll be able to see that my Redis instance is running on 6379 on localhost. So that's what the instance that needs to be. So it needs to be localhost on that port. So basically my application will actually know where my Redis instance live. So in order for me to do that, I'm going to put this localhost with the port 6379. So just like a disclaimer here, this is not the best way to inject the configuration for your Redis server inside our service. Again, this is a sample application. I did this just to make sure that uh, I would, were able to do it quickly. The best way to do it is to store it inside the configuration and pass it along to the service. Right now, this is just like a quick way so we can actually demonstrate its capability. But again, this is not the, the best way to store this inside your uh, service. Just an FYI here. Okay, so <clears throat> once we have done that, the next step is we need to actually initialize the cache. So we're gonna put cache db equal redis dot get database. And basically right now we're able to connect to the database. And something I forgot to do, we need to make this as a private. So now we have private i database. Why is not happy? Mm -hmm. Okay, we referenced the wrong one. So let's remove this one and yeah, that should be fine. And now we have our uh, Redis connection ready. So now when you start need to implement these three methods. So the first one is gonna be the get data. So let's remove this. And basically what we're gonna be doing is we need to check, first of all, we need to connect to the Redis instance, get the value. If it is there, we return it, else we return an empty object. So that's what we're gonna be doing. So we're gonna put var uh, value or var, yeah, value, that should be fine. Equal underscore cash to be dot get actually string get. And basically string get here, all we need to do is pass the key and it will match the key to whatever exists inside our Redis cache. Because basically something maybe I forgot to mention, Redis is basically a key value. So key and a value, key and a value. So for example, if I call it users, it's gonna get me a list of users. If I call it drivers, list of drivers. Driver one, it's gonna get me one driver, something like that. So it's a key value pair. So I need to refer to the key that I wanna get inside from Redis. So this is gonna be the key. Then I'm gonna check if not empty. So basically string dot is is null or white space is null or empty, let's say, of value. So if it's not, I'm gonna return the value. Let's return it. Okay, that's another point I wanna mention. So 
Right now, what we're doing is, let's say we have a list of drivers. I have 100 drivers, for example. And this, uh, the way it's being stored in Redis is like being stored as, a, as we said, key value, and it's being stored as a string. The, one, the way we wanna process it is we don't wanna really process it as a string. What we need to do is we need to convert it to an object. And here, what we need to do is we need to serialize it. And basically what that means is we're gonna be basically converting it from a list of string to an object that we can actually utilize within our C sharp code. And this is really important. So right now what we're gonna be doing is just, we're gonna take this uh, a list, uh, for example, of objects that we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have. We're gonna make sure that the string is not empty because if it's empty or, um, or null, we're not gonna be able to serialize it. Once we make sure it's not empty or null and we're able to serialize it, we're going to be serializing it to the type of object that the user has passed and then we're going to be return it. So we're going to put return, uh, return, going to be JSON serializer dot deserialize. Okay, let's fix this first. Deserialize of type T and then we're gonna take the value and that's gonna be basically it. Sun here was saying possible null reference, that's fine, we already did this check here. Else what we're gonna be doing is return default. And default means here if we hover over it, it says basically is we're returning a nullable type of that object that we needed. So basically we already covered. So that's gonna be the get data. The remove data is also gonna be very simple. Whereas also all we need to do is Let's go here and we're going to do the same thing. So var uh, exist, we're going to say. So first we're going to check if the key exists or not before we remove anything. So we're going to put cache db dot key exist, just like a, a built-in functionality. And we're going to pass the key. So we're going to say if exist, what we're going to be doing is return, which is going to return a Boolean cache db dot key delete basically we're deleting the data from there and we're going to pass the key else what we're going to be doing is return false very simple so we checked first is that if the key exists if the key exists is basically then we initiated the key delete functionality if not we just return false very simple straight to the point so once we have done that the next step and the last one here is going to be set data and set data is quite simple as well. Everything here is quite simple. So we're gonna put var expiry time. So we need to get the expiry time of actually when we are setting this data equal expiration time, which is gonna be getting from here, dot date time, dot subtract date time dot now. So basically we're gonna be passing uh, passing along when it's gonna be the expiry time, five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes, one minute, whatever we want from here. And once we, exp uh, once we pass it, all we need to do is check whatever time we are in and then we're gonna subtract it. So once that is done, all we need to do right now is var uh, set, we're gonna say it. Actually put is set equal underscore cache db dot string set. And here it's gonna ask us, we can see for the key first. So we're gonna put the key. Then what we need to do is we need to convert any object that we get into a string because that's really important. We cannot store it as object, we need to store them as strings. Once we store them as strings and then we pass the expiry time. So in order for us to basically do the, uh, do the uh, convert them to a string, what we need to do is we need to serialize them. So in order for us to do that, we're gonna put JSON serializer serialize and we're just going to serialize the value and lastly we're going to just pass the expiry time and I think that's it yeah and then once that is done all we need to do return if it's successfully or not yeah let's make it dot or just like this it's even better Okay, so now that we have set up our service and basically we are able to uh, configure it the way we want, we basically were able to create an interface, implement that interface, connect to our uh, Redis cache. Now we need, what we need to do is we need to update our program.cs in order for it to be first aware of this interface. Then we're gonna be creating our controller where we can actually able to see and implement this uh, uh, service inside our controller. So let's go to program.cs. And I'm gonna do it after the connection string. All I'm gonna say is builder.services 
oops, oops, oops. <coughs> dot services dot add scoped. And basically here I'm gonna pass the iCache service and the cache service. Just gonna close it, oops. Close it like this. And let's fix this. Perfect. Now let's just do a dot not build. Make sure everything is building as it should be. So, it, <coughs> excuse me. So it built successfully, and we can see that we have built succeeded, which is exactly what we want. So once we have done all of that, now let's create our nice controller. So, where is our controllers folder? Let's create a new class, and this class we're gonna call it drivers controller. Typical Visual Studio code. So we're gonna put drivers controller.cs. I'm gonna take whatever exists here, uh, similar all of this, we just update it instead of me rewriting everything. Just paste this here and we're just gonna call this drivers controller and let's paste this here. And I think that's it. And we don't really need this, so let's remove this. Well, we need this, yeah, we don't really need this. So now we have a very simplistic control controller. All we have is a uh, constructor in it. Great. So once we have done that, the next step is we need to actually inject our services and our application DB contacts. So here, we're gonna put the private, read only, iLogger, and we're gonna put, uh, sorry, not iLogger. Apologies, we're gonna put i cache service. I'm gonna call it cache service. And it's gonna ask me to fix those references. So let's fix them now. And let me copy this. And let's put this on the new line. And all we need to do is just here, do it like this. Let's remove the underscore. Okay, it looks good. And we're gonna put here underscore cache service equal cache service. We're just injecting a new uh, an interface inside our controller. Now let's do this again, but not right now for our AppDB context. So it's gonna be private read only uh, space app DB context. We're gonna call it context. And let's fix those references. Let's copy this one again. Let's put it here. Let's remove this. And this is basically gonna be underscore context equal context. Perfect. So now what we did is we have injected basically the caching service and our applica application DB conduct so we can utilize it. Another way is you can have, for example, like the unit of work uh, implementation where basically you just uh, call your unit of work here. Again, for simplicity's sake, I'm directly injecting my DB contacts. It does not should be like the way you should actually build, uh, uh, inject your uh, DB contacts into your controller. But again, uh, this is all for uh, this sample application to see how we can actually utilize cache. So once we have done all of that, right now let's start actually building our uh, endpoints. So the first endpoint that we're gonna be taking a look at is our get endpoint for all of the users. So. We're gonna put first HTTP get, and we're gonna say drivers, because we're gonna get all of the drivers list. And I'm gonna put public, async, task, I action result, and we're just gonna call it get. Very simple. And the first thing that we're gonna be doing here before we jump into this, there's a nice diagram that I wanna show. So let's go back here. And let's go to, I think, here on up. Can't really remember where it is. Let's see. Let's zoom out a bit so we can see it. Let's put it on 100. Okay, this is it. So let's check this out. 150. Okay. 
So basically here, this is what we're gonna, this is the logic that we're gonna be implementing. And this logic is basically gonna be through with us, through the, all of the different, uh, uh, all of the different requests that we're gonna be doing. So in essence, first things first, we're gonna receive a request. Once this, once this request is being received, the first thing that we're gonna be doing is we need to check our cache. Do we, do we have an answer for this request inside our cache? Yes or no? If, if yes, we're gonna go uh, check the cache information. So inside our cache, does this information that exists within our cache has expired or is still valid? If it's still valid, we can take this information from the cache and return it back to the user. Else, for if the cache is not there or if it has expired, what we need to do is we need to go back to the database, get the information from there, then we need to actually set the cache and then we return back to the user. So we can see that we have this flow of uh, first checking the cache and then basically whatever data we get from the database, we need to set back in the cache and then we can return the data. And this is the model that we're gonna be following now. So if we go back to our Visual Studio code, the first thing, as we said, we need to check the information from the cache, check cache data. So here we're gonna put var cache data equal underscore uh, cache service dot get data. And here, what do we want? We need to get an I enumerable of a driver, basically a list of drivers. And basically, and I wanna refer to them from the key drivers. That's it. Let me fix those references. So basically here, I'm just telling it, it needs to connect to the cache service. It needs to get the data. I'm passing the anonymous type, which is here gonna be a list of drivers. And I'm giving it the key, which is gonna be drivers. And first of all, we need to check if cache data is not equal to null or, and sorry, we can say cache data dot count is bigger than zero. What we can do, we can return cache data. We can return okay, like a 200 request, 200 response with the cache data. As simple as that. All we're doing is basically checking, checking our cache. Does this information exist in our cache? Yes or no. So in case if yes, we need to make sure it's not null. We need to make sure it's not an empty string. And based on that, what we're doing is we're serializing and returning everything back to the user. So the next step is if it fails, so we need to get from the database. So first of all, let's get it. So it's going to be, let's say cache data equal await underscore db con oops, uh, context dot drivers dot uh, let's say to list async as simple as that. We're getting all of the drivers list. That doesn't really matter. So once we have gotten all of this list, now we need to actually say, if we go back to the diagram, we need to make sure that we are setting the cache. So now we need to set the expiry time. So for this, we're gonna put for expiry time equal date time offset dot now dot add for now it's going to be five minutes so we're going to say add minutes oops i was just going to make it five minutes actually for the sake of this let's just make it 30 seconds add seconds let's make it as 30 seconds Okay, just for the simplicity sake of this sample. Okay, so now once we have done that, all we need to do is go back to the cache service. We're gonna put set data, and it's gonna be again as an I enumerable of driver. And then from there, we just need to pass the key, which is gonna be drivers. And then what we need to do, we need to pass the uh, cache data, which is gonna be the results that we wanna store. And lastly, the date time offset, which is gonna be the expiry time. And that's it. And once we have done that, basically we just return okay with the cache data. So this is a very simple uh, implementation how we can actually get the data. We checked first if it exists or not. If it did, we sent it back. If uh, then we got from the database, we stored it in the cache, and then we basically returned it. Very simple, straight to the point. So another one is basically, let's see how we can add the data. So now let's see how we can actually send the data. So we're gonna put a HTTP post and we're gonna say call it add drivers. 
and this is gonna be public async task i action result and we're just gonna call it post and we're gonna put the driver we're gonna put value and here basically what we need to do is we're just gonna add it through our db context and basically let's see how we can do that we're just gonna say for uh, added object equal await underscore context dot drivers dot add oops add dot add async and we're gonna add the value and from here all i'm gonna be doing is i'm gonna put var actually it's gonna be something around the we need to set this in the cache so we're gonna put cache service dot set data it's gonna be a driver and basically we're just gonna call it driver very simple and actually we need to remove the data in case there's another cache with the same driver uh, okay uh, what, what or we can do it in a way okay let's do it in this way so let's put the added object value that entity and let's take the same expiry time let's copy paste it here and we'll put here expiry time something like that and here what i'm gonna do is just gonna append the id so it will be cached for this id something like that uh, value.id yeah that's that's a better way to do it and then what i can do is just put await context dot save it changes async and first return okay um okay i just return added object dot entity okay so now we have seen how we can add and how we can extract the last one that we're going to be doing is we're going to be seeing how we can actually delete stuff from our cache so for this we're just going to put uh let's see it's going to be delete so let's make it http context let's do actually http delete delete the driver and it's going to be public public async task i action result and basically i'm gonna call it delete all we need is the id and uh, id so first of all we need to check if it exists or not uh when so we need to get from the database so var uh exist we're gonna say it equal uh, context dot drivers dot first or default async and uh, we're gonna just make a match x dot id equal equal id and let's make this awaitable first or default async let's make it and now we're gonna say if actually yeah if exist not equal to null Else we we'll just return uh we we'll just return not found because basically i don't want to give a lot of information about it so i'm just going to turn not found or yeah not found that should be fine again it's all for the demo and here what i can do is very simple put uh, context dot remove exist and then i can put caching service dot remove data and it was driver uh, what did we do it like that okay let's copy this driver.id so without this this and this and that should be it and lastly once we've done all of that we're just gonna put contact actually await contacts to save it changes async okay great and lastly once you delete we return no contact so return no content perfect 
So this is gonna be our application very simply. We created three uh, actions. The first one is to add, uh, sorry, the first one to get everything. The second one is to add and the third one to delete. Here we are covering the three main functionalities of our cache service. So once we have done all of that, uh, then now it's now time to test it out. So let's see. So inside our terminal, let's clear it out. We're gonna put .NET build uh, yeah, to make sure it's building. .NET run. Perfect, now if we go to this URL, actually before I do that, let me disable HTTPS, it's gonna create an issues. Okay, let's run it again. So let's copy this one here, and let's actually open it in the same web browser. And let's take it from here, and let's put swagger forward slash index.html. And we can see from here that we are actually able to see our three endpoints. So let's try to add a driver now. We're gonna add the first one, ID one. Uh, we're gonna put, uh, tu -tu -tu. we're gonna put Sir Lewis Hamilton. Driver number is 44. So now I'm gonna just execute. And we it successfully added right now. If I get it, try it out, execute. I was able to get it directly. So if I execute again, we can see how fast the response is. We can see that I'm able to directly get the results. But after 30 seconds, this will gonna take a bit longer because it's gonna start getting it from the database. So let's see. Let's wait 30 seconds. I think 30 seconds should have been passed now. Uh, I think if we open it in Insomnia, insom let's open it in Insomnia, we're able to see the time frame. So let's just put testing here and let's zoom in. Okay, I think this should looks good. Let's see. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're just gonna create a new request and let's copy this URL. And let's paste it here. So right now, we can see that this took 48 milliseconds. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be creating a new driver. So let me take this request. Snare the new request uh, and make, make it post. And I'm just gonna take the same body and put body as JSON, paste it here, ID equal to and this is gonna be myself. Driver number, I don't know, 11144. Let's see, send, it's being added. So now if I get this, we can see that my response time is way lower. So we can see here it's getting 29, 20, because it's getting it from the cache. Uh, this is all, uh, and then it went back to 24, then it cached it. So right now it's 30, 30, 28, 20, 39 because it went to the database after 30 seconds and then it cached it again. Again, because it's local on my machine, it's not gonna really show a big of a difference within the time, but actually when you run it on a live production environment and you have connections between different database server, you're gonna be able to see all of these differences. Lastly, what let's see, let's try the delete. So now we have done all of that. Now let's see the delete driver. So I'm just gonna delete ID number one execute, we can see it has been deleted successfully. We got the 204, uh, no content has been found, which means that all of our applications running as it should be, the data is being stored in Redis and basically we're able to pull it out with the right uh, correct expiry date. So now let's do a quick summary. So in today's session, we have explored why do we need to use cache and how it's affect our uh, implementation, how it, how it affect the performance of our API. We saw how we utilize Redis, install it on our machine using Redis. We saw how we can actually able to uh, add Redis to our web API, .NET 6 web API. We'll be able to see how we can create a Redis uh, um, service or caching service. We can see how we saw how we can actually integrate it within our controller. And basically we're able to see how we can implement it uh, to for different functionality like adding, removing and extracting. So I hope this video really helped. If you like this video, 
video, please like, share, and subscribe. It will really help the channel. As well, if you'd like to support me, please consider supporting me on Patreon as well on or buying me a coffee. Uh, if you support me on Patreon, you'll be able to get access to all of this source code. Uh, I hope this video was helpful and uh, have a great day.